All right, Delinquent Nation, Prison Diaries. We've got the man himself, Sean Atwood. <laughs> I'm excited to have him on. We've got a brilliant story that I can finally get out on my channel. I can finally get to understand myself. You've got a very successful podcast and you've got your books there and you're doing loads. So, yeah, I'd like to dive into your story. And also, if anyone wants to check out his stuff, he's got amazing interviews. Go on his channel. All the links will be in the description. So what's going I'm on, a huge fan of yours, man. <laughs> Been watching him for ages. Same way, man. Do yeah. you know what I mean? And, I, and you interviewed me yesterday. so Blown away. Yeah. Yeah. So it would can't wait to get it out. Yeah. Can't wait to get that one out of there. Everyone go and check out his channel to see that interview. I and, I, really and now he's trying to get me drunk. I don't even drink. <laughs> Tried to get him on the magnums. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to taste a bit of that? Yeah, go and try a bit, man. It's a bit it's like of the GHB. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got Sean trying the magnums. <laughs> wow. Mm. Sweet, isn't it? Spicy wine. Yeah. Yeah. It's good for you in bed as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like my throat right now is like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking and like wearing my tonsils out. It's like, yeah, you've lit them up. Yeah, <laughs> good man. Magnum, if you want to come and sponsor this, <laughs> you're, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> but yeah, I want to um, get right into your story, bro, man. Um, and, you know, we're going to start off. I know we've got very, and I found out yesterday that we got kind of similar stories in the way we came about doing what we was doing. But like, yeah, let's get into... Your fellow pioneer. Yeah, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, let's get into your life growing up. How was the home life like, education? So, chemical manufacturing town called Widnes, rugby league, and grew up in the town centre pretty much. Didn't have that much money. Road terraced houses. Mum's like a housewife and my dad is a door-to-door -door insurance salesman. Word. So I, I get into school, don't I? And what was it? It was Maggie Thatcher was selling off British Telecom. And my dad is a big Labour supporter. Where? So I asked, I said to my dad, can I get 50 quid to invest in the stock market? And he's like, what's that about? Like, you know, Maggie Thatcher's selling British Telecom. He's like, bugger off. <laughs> we, ain't, we ain't supporting Maggie bloody Thatcher. <laughs> We're not bloody Tories like your nan. Yeah. And when he said nan, light bulb went off over my head. Jogged down to my nan's house. Got 50 quid off her to put in it. And it doubled right away. What, straight away? Straight away. First day of dealings, it went from 50p to 99p, 100p. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think we sold it right away. 100% profit. And I was addicted, man, to the stock market the stock from market. that moment. Yeah. Went down the library, got loads of books. My economics teachers give me like extra classes. So it was a weird situation for a kid to have this focus, wasn't it? At, at how, that how, age. how old was you? 14 when I started following it. And then 16 when I made my first investment. By 18, 19, I was trading like options, derivatives. Oh, yeah. And then by the time I was at uni, like all my family members wanted to get in on it. Oh, on, 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 on investments. We were setting up accounts in the pets' names and everything. Because <laughs> <laughs> you only got a, a certain quota. Yeah. If you applied to these new stock market issues that Maggie Thatcher was doing, you'd only get like 100 shares per person or something. So we had to like. Oh, expand, yeah. Spread it out. Yeah. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I kind of. I've got an idea of what you do because I've kind of got into the whole crypto thing now. Yeah. And I'm very much into that, you mm -hmm. know. That's kind of like stocks, isn't it? Yes. Do you know what I mean? But my best mate was a maniac. So I was the studious one. Yeah. Wild man, in his school, he suddenly grew so big, he picked the school teacher up and put him in the bin. Word. And then the teachers were so scared of him, they had him outside raking leaves. So I'm studying, he's come knocking on my door. He's all black and blue. He's all buzzing. He's been fighting the bouncers in in the town. He's only a kid. Yeah. And he's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. So at the top of the town, there was an area called Pex Hill. It's countryside and there's a quarry. If you, if you sneak through the iron fence, uh, there was a tree we would sit on overlooking the quarry that we call the thinking tree. Yeah. So there was me, Wild Man, and Wild Man's cousin, Hammy. Okay. So Hammy would ask us what we're going to do with our lives. And Wildman's like, I've got red dots in my head telling me to hurt people. I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. 
And then I'm like, no, you're not, Peter. I'm going to fly you to America. I'm going to make a million in the stock market. Fly you to America. You're going to be a wrestler. You're going to wrestle Andrew, Andrew the Giant and all this shit. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm just an idealist little, little kid. And um, that's what happened. He went to prison and I went to America. And it, it, it took a while for me to get established. But then I flew him over. Okay. Um, yeah. And so what, did he go to prison from a young age, Ward, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you made your way to America. Yeah. Doing stocks and whatnot. Wolf of Wall Street, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember, like, the, the meetings in the office and shit? Yeah. It was just like that. So, our boss, he looked like a, a mafia don. He's got these two heavy hitters, stockbrokers, in to give us a motivational meeting. Big board behind them. And they're like, it's like military style, drill sergeant style. They're like, <clears throat> you're only as big. As your numbers are on this board for the month. If you're calling your wives, calling your girlfriends, other brokers are calling your clients. Yeah. If you're having lunch, if you're having breaks, other brokers are calling your clients. <laughs> smile and dial. We had to have mirrors where we were sat and smile at ourselves while we were dialing. Or we had 24 foot curly cords because pacing brokers made the most money. Wow. It was fucking nuts. Stop broking sounds fancy. People think, yeah, stop broken. It's, it's glorified telesales. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. but I I kind of see it like, because I've seen Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. Is it so? It's just like that. You they had Hell's Angels dropping off meth. They're this, this snorting lines of coke and meth off their desks. Any uh, celebration, a limo would arrive with striptease girls in it, would be off to the striptease club. They put me on what was called the criminal quad from the get go. So there was three other guys with me who were, who were hardcore. One of them was a Vietnam vet who would have random flashbacks and just start kung fu kicking the area around <laughs> him. <laughs> One of them had just got out of prison and he told all his clients he'd been away because he'd been fighting cancer in hospital for the last so many years. Yeah. And he was calling cancer patients and bonding with them and getting them to invest. And the other one was a really uh, icy <laughs> person who had like, he was an alcoholic, he had like gin, vodka, whatever it was in his, in his briefcase all the time. Yeah. But yeah, that's... They school me in, in the stock market stuff, yeah. Oh, word. Yeah. And were you very successful in that? Did you... No, I was shit. No? So my, for my first two years, I was in a race against my student credit cards, running out of money before I was about to come home. So I just went on a visitor's visa, didn't have any work visa, and stayed. Mm. And I've, all I've got is my student credit cards. So I'm living off cheese on toast and bananas the first couple of years. Wow. Yeah. Were, were you trading or investing? So as a stockbroker, it's telesales. So you're calling people, right? 500 numbers a day. 10 of those people will let you send them your business card and a brochure. Yeah. And maybe one of them will invest. Oh, out of, uh, out out of, of all, budget, all yeah. them. Yeah. And then they'll send you a check for like 10 grand in whatever they're investing in. And you'll get like two, $300 off that. Word, yeah. yeah that's yeah. how it worked, yeah. Sound kind of difficult, man. <sighs> I mean... It, it was a baptism of fire in a sense. Like I had a bit of social anxiety. And that's what got me onto the drugs as a young person. And you're calling people up and 500, 490 out of 500 telling you to fuck off. Mm. I'm having dinner. You know, take me off your list. Yeah. But it, it does break you in. Yeah. 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 So, um, so would you, would you say like, did you end up living the dream over there? Well, I brought wild man over, didn't I? Um, I've got him. Uh, so by the time you got him over, were yeah. you doing all right? Or just... yeah, I'm making six figures a year at that point. Okay. So I fly him over. I get him a house near the Georgian Dragon British pub in Central Phoenix, thinking he's just gonna have a beer with the expats and not get in any trouble. Yeah. Um, about three weeks into it, me and my girlfriend go to visit Peter. And this is your girlfriend from America. Yeah. Yeah. You met her in America. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we knock on the door, and some Mexican guys answer, and we're like, "Where's Peter?" And they're like, oh, Peter, there's no Peter. Like, yeah, where's Peter? He lives here. Like, no, there's no Peter. And they all start fucking pulling guns out. So me and my bird are like backpedaling over the street thinking we're about to get shot here. Yeah. And then Peter, he's a big guy. When he died, he was 29 and a half stones, six foot two. Peter being wild, man. Wild, man. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so he just bounces over the road, all smiles. I'm like, Peter, you nearly just got us fucking killed. What's going on with your place? Yeah. He goes, oh, right. They're the local crack dealers. Yeah. They like to move around a lot. I've let them stay in my place. I'm staying in their place over the street. They're buzzing because I can do a $100 crack rock in one breath. It goes sizzle, 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 and it calms down my red dots. 
Oh shit, word. He said the one at the back is the Colombian guy from Cali who's running it yeah. and he wants to invest in the stock market. I'm like, oh, please, man. <laughs> <laughs> but that place ended up with a corpse on the doorstep and we had to move him. Is it? Yeah. How, how did that come about? So, a few more weeks later, I am um, in the office, get a call. Um, my aunt calls the office. Turn headline news on right now. It's Peter's house. There's it's yellow. happened in Peter's house. Yeah. There's yellow tape all around yeah. his house. Someone's dead. It might be Peter. Get your ass up there. Yeah. Zoom. I go up there. Yellow tape. The media are there. The police are there. I've got drugs in the car. I'm like, fuck this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm shitting myself thinking he, he might be dead, but I'm also, I don't want to get busted. I go back to the office and I go back later that evening and... If it was cleared up, there was still blood on the step. I walk in and he's sat in the living room with a homicide detective. So I'm, thank God he's not dead. They've done gunpowder tests on him, so it wasn't him. Yeah. So what happened was a couple came over to get drugs from the Mexicans, but they'd moved over the street. So the female went over the street to get the drugs and the male stayed with Peter. Peter's never seen a gun before. Oh, yeah. The guy's got a gun. He's like, I'm from England. We don't have guns. Can you show me your gun? So the guy starts demonstrating the gun, says the safety's on, pulls the trigger and shoots, shoots himself, himself in the head. Wow. Shoots himself in the head. Wow. So Peter had to move in a hurry. Uh, he was having nightmares about it all and everything. So we moved him to a west side flat with a, a woman from the drug community that he'd met. Yeah. She was in there with her girlfriend and the girlfriend's fella, big steroid head bouncer, he had like blonde Chippendale style permed hair, thought yeah. he was a tough guy, spoke this like weird accent. And um I thought, all right, you know, he's 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 acting a bit tough and will he will him and Peter clash? I'm thinking. But anyway, I, they were behind on the rent. I went and met the landlady, gave her a check. Next day I get called at the office, Peter's been evicted. Said, what, even though you pay for the rent? Yeah, yeah. I said, Why has he been evicted? Yeah. She said that the roommate he beat the roommate up. What the steroid is. Yeah. And I said, well, how do you know he's beat the roommate? What proof is there of that? She said, the steroid head was seen running through the apartment complex in the middle of the night with powder, plasterboard powder all over his face. And there's multiple human head size holes in the walls. No way. I'm like, Peter, what the fuck did you do that for? And he said he kept talking shit to me, saying he was a gangster disciple and throwing all these hand signs <laughs> and fake saying how tough he was fighting all these people at the club. So I just fucking put his head through the wall, I was sick of it. <laughs> Fortunately, I was able to stop the check yeah. before it got cashed. Before it got cashed. So in. one of the women, she, the other woman had a boyfriend in Tempe, another part of near Phoenix, a suburb. And she, they were behind on the rent. So I fixed that situation. And it was Peter moving to that place was where the whole criminal enterprise started. Because I'm not a gangster, I'm a business nerd. Yeah. Peter's a serious guy and he, people like look up to him and he talks to anyone. Yeah. So he opened the door through the people who came to his apartment uh, into that world for me yeah. to get the connections to build up the enterprise. Okay, so he, he was building up a bit of respect over the... Because he was just a maniac. Yeah. Everywhere he went. He didn't give a fuck. I mean, we were at a biker, meth head, pool hall style bar and a giant walks in and whenever Peter's going to do something, when his red dots are triggered, one eyebrow stays completely flat yeah. and the other eyebrow goes up like that. Yeah. So it's almost fucking vertical. Yeah. So this giant walks in. Peter's been smoking crack and meth all week. His eyes just look like the devil and his eyebrow goes up. I'm like, oh, Peter, don't do anything, please. He just makes a beeline for the giant, grabs his hand, looking up at his face. My name's Peter. The giant goes, yeah, my name's whatever. And Peter starts squeezing his hand. And goes, if I were you, I'd be in the circus, you fucking freak. Giant goes, what did you just say? <laughs> and Peter's like, you fucking heard me, I'd be in the circus, you fucking freak. The giant just looks in his eyes. This maniac, his eyes are just completely blood red. He hasn't yeah. slept in a week. And he's um, on drugs and everything. Yeah, and he's, he saw the devil, I think. And yeah. he, he just he chilled the situation out. And he goes, you guys want to come outside and see my car? Yeah. So we went outside and he showed us his car and he's, his seat was in the back. He was so big. 
Yeah. He even gave us his number and said he wanted to hang out and come collecting debts and stuff with, with Peter. Oh, word, yeah. But we lost his number. Yeah. Imagine those two showing up at your place, bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would, yeah, that would have been a bit of a duo, man. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you say like you've ended up meeting these connects and that? Through him, the New Mexican Mafia. He had Russians over, he had Italians over, he had gangbangers, street gangs. Wherever he went, he took control of the street people. Yeah. So he'd have like um, street walking, transgender, sex workers partying with him, yeah. as well as gang bangers and homeless uh, people who were like crackheads, would be cooking up crack in his kitchen. Yeah. And, and he'd just have all these different people from all different walks of life. And for the first time ever, they were all on ecstasy for the first time. Yeah. Can you yeah. imagine every, people who wouldn't probably normally talk, telling each other the life stories and bonding. Yeah. So that's how it all came about, was through his first place, Rancho Marietta, it was called that, that complex in, in Tempe. So he, he had, he basically had all the clientele. Not clientele, because you could not give Peter any drugs. Okay. Any amount of drugs you gave him, and he would try and trick you. He would say, I want to sell this, but he would just do Ended it himself. Taking it, yeah. We were on the way to a rave once in California, Big Bear Lake. And we were on acid and we were tripping and we thought the police were behind us. We were like, who's going to swallow the drugs? So there was all these drugs in the bag, including like half an ounce of crystal meth. And Peter's like, yeah, I'll swallow the fucking drugs. <laughs> He's fucking ate all the drugs, right? <laughs> so we're leaving Phoenix, Arizona, where it's almost 50 degrees. We've got our like sandals on and shorts. We're going Big Bear Lake Mountain, freezing cold in California. He's, his body is trying to get rid of these drugs so fast we're freezing cold right and then we get clothes and stuff from friends we know that he's roasting hot yeah it's, it's sweating sweat. it's, it's all these all, all the drugs yeah. are coming out of his entire body and he was just loving it wow he's loving it. oh he, yeah he, he's lucky he didn't, he's lucky he didn't overdose he's, well he's dead now because of a consequence of all this Is he it? had multiple organ failure uh just over a year ago he was only in his 40s so rest in peace man. i mean he, when he was doing meth walkabouts we wouldn't see him for days yeah. he'd either wake up in a house and get arrested or he'd fucking go unconscious because he was dehydrated by the heat and end up in hospital so and dam damaging his heart so we visited him in hospital on those occasions mm. show up he says have you got any e and i think when he gets out of hospital he wants to celebrate yeah gave him the e fucking necked it right there in the hospital in the hospital with all these things strapped to him all these monitors fucking so 30 40 minutes later all the monitors are going fucking weird we had to run out the hospital before because we had all these drugs on us yeah that's wild yeah um can you just explain because you see meth that's not that's not over here do you know what i mean i can't understand why it's not because the coke heads you're doing a, a line every so many hours or whatever to maintain your high People just went over to meth in America because you do online and that's it. You awake till the next day. You don't need any, you don't need to top it up. Yeah. I and know, it costs a lot less. I know about meth from like Breaking Bad and that. Yeah, Jesse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love Breaking I cried when fucking Walter White rescued Jesse at the end. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a sick box set, man. Yeah. But were you saying you guys was all involved in that? Did you ever try meth? Yeah, yeah, totally. So I, I was... Um, what was your first experience when you I've first tried, tried nearly it? all drugs. Yeah. But with meth, I did have a little thing for it. Not as bad as well, man, because I never smoked anything. Yeah. People who smoke drugs can consume a lot. And when you've got unlimited amounts, you, you, you just go through it. And that's why you would go paranoid and berserk. Yeah. But with me, I would either snort meth or eat it or do hot rails. What's hot rails? So with a hot rail, when I said I didn't smoke it, I'm going to contradict myself now. Um, with a hot rail, you've got a glass tutor yeah right and you put half of it on like the heat the heating of the cooker yeah so half of it's hot yeah yeah and then you've got your line of meth it's powder but, but as you snort the powder it, it turns into smoke oh because of the, the heat oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but it wasn't a smoke so i did, only did that on occasion my main thing was eating it or snorting it yeah yeah what effects did it have on you? Man? See, when I was a stockbroker, right, and you got to be aggressive to get your numbers up on the board. Yeah. And I'm not an aggressive person, but meth, you think you're superhuman. Yeah. So I became the top producing stockbroker in my office on crystal meth because instead of asking people for 10 grand, 
I'd be asking them for a hundred grand. <laughs> but this is not an advertisement for meth, folks. Because when you start on drugs, the side effects are very low, but meth, the side effects come in fast. And there was a guy, Headline News, yeah. Postman, before or after picture one year, looked completely healthy. year later, he was gaunt as fuck, meth sores and everything. Mm. He was driving on the motorway, freeway, it's called out there. He'd been up for a week. He was having crystal meth psychosis, looked in the mirror. His two sons are in the back. He thinks one of them's a demon. No way. Gets like a Rambo knife out and pulls over and cuts his son's head off in front of his other son. No. Yeah, so stay away from meth, people. Stay, away from, stay away from all drugs, man. Yeah, and I, I just want to... I'm very excitable. Uh, I like being around you. Yeah. And I just want to give a disclaimer that I do work in drugs education now. I, I was at school in London this morning. I scared the living daylights out of, out of kids with what I went through and... My mum had a nervous breakdown, the conditions in the jail, my sister had to counselling. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm a hardcore on a programme to keep drug kids away from drugs and crime. Yeah, yeah mad respect, man. Maximum respect. All right, so um, so how did you get into selling ease now? And how did you get on such a scale that you, you got it on? All right, so rave, all right. Manchester rave scene, Manchester, Liverpool, going clubs like in uh, Manchester my main the first one I went to was the Thunderdome Oldham Road Conspiracy Hacienda a little bit Liverpool it was the state Scrapyard in Toxteth Quadrant Park later on and first time I took it because I had social anxiety wouldn't go up and talk to women wouldn't dance too self-conscious yeah. and you know I'm in my late teens university took ecstasy took a, a rapper Billy Wiz 45 minutes in my knees buckle <laughs> And this boring room with this weird music all started making sense. <laughs> yeah. doom, doom, doom. My mate who I went with, he pulls me up. Yeah, we just start dancing. And I, I'd never really got into dancing before that. Yeah. I didn't even want to take a pee break. I was just enjoying it. That'd so get you moving though, didn't it? I kept me moving, man. The whole room was just pulsing. Yeah. And that became my religion. So I, I said I had that goal on the thinking tree to make a million by the time I was 30 in the stock market. My ne now my goal after the rave scene was when I make that million, I'm gonna I'm gonna transfer that rave scene over to America. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah but it, yeah, it, it got it got dark. It yeah, got dark. It got dark. Well, you didn't really work out. <laughs> no, it worked out for many years. Yeah. So in the beginning, I was hooking up through the locals, and the locals saw me, you know, coming to the raves. I got a nice car, and they called me the Bank of England. Yeah. So there's all these competing little crews coming to the Bank of England to invest in their raves. Okay. And the rave scene's just starting. Yeah. So I became an integral part of the fledgling rave scene in Arizona, clicked up with all the local people. I think you described something with, you said the users, all the information flowed up to you from the users. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They were the yeah, locals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing. Same thing, yeah. Same thing. Word. Competition coming in or undercover cops coming in. You're going to find that, aren't you, from yeah, the locals? Yeah, from the locals. So the, one of the main locals then was Acid Joey. Native American, stocky guy, discovered him at this dingy fucking underground rave thing in some bit, some studio. There was a circle of people watching him dance. Yeah. He was on ketamine and he was just so fluid. He should have been in music videos. Yeah. So I figured he's on good shit, him. I need to get talking to him. So when he was outside, I approached him and said, you know, can you get me some E? I'm from England, blah, blah, blah. And they, they all buzz off the English accent as well. Yeah. Plus I had all these tapes. Tapes, this is how old the story is. Yeah. 808 State Show from Manchester and I was showing <laughs> showing them all. And um, So Acid Joey could get us like 20 pills in the beginning, 50, maybe 100. And he said that the local suppliers were getting them out of LA. Yeah. So we organised a thousand pill purchase out of LA. Okay, Shoot. and was the ecstasy scene like big in America at the time? No, because it was here, wasn't it? I mean, you got yeah, Chicago know, yeah. House, you got Detroit Techno, you got Ibiza, but then the whole scene really blew up in England across the country. Yeah, because when I saw it on the news as a teenager, it was every weekend. Yeah, like why died ravers? You're smiling. The police were like, "What the fuck are we gonna do about these people?" Convoys on the motorway from the end as far as you could see just full of ravers and the cops couldn't do anything about it. So yeah. it, was a, it was like a, it was a revolution in, of music in this country like I had never seen. Yeah. Before raves, you had to line up at a nightclub in your suit and your tie and, and the bouncers would look at you like you were shit. Yeah. And the young people were sick of it. Yeah, so yeah. So they just broke into warehouses and airplane hangers and, and wore all these psychedelic clothes. Yeah. Like hippies from the 60s. Yeah. And did what the fuck they wanted. Yeah. So that swept 
the whole country. I mean, even my finals for my degree, I had all that rave music just going. I, I've been on E all weekend and I sat my finals on Monday. It was all boop, 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 going up in my head. Yeah, so it was, it was a revolution. Yeah. So in America, something like that would initially come into New York and LA. That's how it, and then it, 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 go, it moves. Because if you, if you think about the size of America, it's like Europe, really. Yeah, Every yeah. state is almost like a different country, country in yeah. size and, and cultural differences. And um, so it, it was just starting. They were delayed by several years behind us. Yeah. But I got in at the start over there. Yeah. So then I said, Joey hooks me up with that and arranges a thousand pill purchase in LA yeah. through this surfer gangster guy called Sol. Yeah. Have you, I didn't even know surfer gangsters were real. I'd That's what that. I was saying. This whole story sounds yeah. nuts, man, because you've got surfer gangsters. Have you, watched Point Break? Have you watched Point Break? No, I haven't seen that. Point Break is like a, a bank robbery movie, I think. And it's got surfer gangsters in it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I've seen that, actually. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. So there's two car loads of us go out there. Yeah. Me and Well, man, in my car. And then Seth and Acid Joey in the other car. They're all dead now because they were all hardcore. Drug the way users, they live. yeah. Acid Joey was found dead in his swimming pool with all of his clothes on and, and Seth's heart went and Seth was a big guy and um, we go out there and the guy's not there so wow man he's not a very patient person yeah. he's like I'm just going to fucking kick his door down and take his shit <laughs> and I'm like Peter you can't be thinking like that we want to establish a connection this yeah. was a, a business experiment if it works I can quit the stock market shit and just get yeah. into this so before you say before you got into that like so you said you was making six figures of yeah, the stock market. Yeah. So you're trying to stop that and then go into... What it is, right? I've got to be in the office for the six o'clock in the morning sales meeting. Yeah. I'm up at 4.30 or whatever. Yeah. And then I'm on the phone all day long. I've got no life. Yeah. And now Peter's come to America and it's party time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If I can make a living out of this. And just have fun. And just and have fun. Yeah. And the women. Your own Strip, time. Striptease dancers and everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I see. I see. Yeah. 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 So I say, to, I say, look, chill out, Peter. Let's just wait for him. The guy shows up. I say, look, I'm going to go in. If I'm not out in 10 minutes, then kick his fucking door in. Yeah. So I go in with the money. I've got a large quantity of money on me, like 10 to 15,000. Yeah. And I go in and I ask, can I try the pill first? And he says, yeah, do you want me to get you a drink of water? I said, no, I'm just going to chew it. And he looks at me a bit funny. Yeah. So I throw it in my mouth. I think it was like uh, Mitsubishi. And I chewed it up. And I, I knew what a good pill tasted like. And yeah. it was from Holland, you know, the beige press. Yeah. 100, 125 milligrams of MDMA. So I said, yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. Uh, you know, you count the pills, uh, give me the pills. And he's just brought out the biggest bag of pills I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. So now this was before I was schooled by the New Mexico Mafia on police protocol. This was when I was really naive. And so in my, I'm in a twin turbo Mazda RX-7 out of Fast and Furious 1. Yeah. I've got a police radar detector on the dashboard. I've got fur seats. I've got a Bose surround sound system. <laughs> and I've took, a, I've took a hit of ecstasy. Yeah. I've got all these pills in the car. I've got a gun under my fucking seat. Yeah. And... Um, we're going like 100, 150 miles an hour on the freeway going back, yeah. listening to Sasha. And when the <laughs> pill hit me, I'll never forget it. I've got Sasha on. I think it was uh, Renaissance was the CD, Sasha and John Digweed. And the fur on the seat just started tickling my head. <laughs> yeah. And my eyes then are like this. I'm rolling. And I'm fucking driving. Yeah. Driving. I'm like just fucking just dancing in the sea. And every now and then the radar detectors going beep, 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 beep. And fucking slamming on the car and we're like fuck where's the police where's the police where's the police and then we get past it and we're just fucking speeding again like like innocent lunatics that was the beginning of it but years later you know everyone's got we've got fucking lawyers on standby we've got everybody schooled yeah. we, we've got all the protocol in place we never even speak ever ever speak on phones it's pages we use pages to arrange meetings and yeah them yeah. days yeah. Did, you have, did, you have, did you have any police on your on your payroll or anything like that? No, but we had um, a lawyer who had relations, let's just say. I don't, I don't yeah, want to... Yeah, get, yeah, you don't need to get too yeah, much yeah. into it. But, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you kind of had something sorted out. Yeah. And if anyone got arrested in our crew, they were told, call this lawyer right away. Mm. We will post your bail money right away. If you are a first-time offender, 
you will not do prison time. They will tell you you are going to go to prison for the rest of your life. Mm. You need to give us the names of who you're supplying. But that's just how they play you. Yeah. Call this lawyer right away. Don't say anything. We will get you out. And it was tight. We had it tight like that. Yeah, yeah. And even we, 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 everyone was very bonded as well because when Sammy the Bull's crew got arrested, 57, mm. they all rolled over. Sammy the Bull, isn't he um, mafia? Yeah, yeah. When his crew got arrested, they all rolled over. Yeah. When my crew got arrested, only four rolled over out of over 100. Well, only <coughs> four people s- Only four cooperated. Yeah. yeah. Which was amazing. Fucking hell. So yeah. how did you end up getting done then in all of this? This is the thing. I was naive. I'd actually met a woman, fall in love, and she taught me out of the importation. She said it was too dangerous. She saw the heavy people I was hanging out with. So this, so so from a thousand <coughs> pills, you ended up getting into Im- importing it. And all right. So we're in the beginning. We're bringing in like thousands through American airports and stuff. But some of our smugglers have situations. So wild woman. Now bear in mind. Wild who, who is wild woman? Wild woman was wild wild man's missus. Missus, right. Permanent missus out of England back then. Okay. Even though wild man had a girlfriend on his first visit, this stripper liked to taser herself. That's <laughs> that's another story. You're going to hear that one later. Um, so wild woman was classified as number two in the Atwood criminal enterprise. Okay. She, that's how serious she was. Wild man was pissed off because he was number three. And she I was, was going to say two. that isn't wasn't he? <clears throat> he been your number two? No. Yeah, he was pissed off because the prosecutor put her as number two on the indictment. Yeah, yeah. What, what was the reason for that? Was she more order of seniority in the in the trafficking because he couldn't traffic anything? He was just kind of muscle. He was an enforcer. Yeah. And he didn't have to beat people up. If people owed money, we would have wild man move in with them. And yeah. if, as soon as he moved in with you, you were sat on your sofa watching the Mexican Mafia take your TV set and there's nothing you could do about it. You've got like gangbangers and prostitutes cooking crack in your kitchen yeah. and it's just 24-7 party central and your whole apartment's getting stripped fucking burr over. The- Everybody moved out within days of Wild Man moving in. So if people owed me money, they knew Wild Man was going to move in room because he was unhousable. Yeah. He set fire to houses, he blew houses up, he was banned from all the hotels. At the end of his first visit, which only lasted months, the striptease woman who liked to taser her mm. vagina, um, <laughs> they were like Bonnie and Clyde. They were just robbing everywhere. They ended up living under a tree with a Rambo knife and a baseball bat. And while man had took control of this Tempe Beach Park, the homeless people, because people were coming and, and beating up the homeless people and because mm. they were hustling and doing drug stuff and shaking the homeless people down yeah so wild man twatted those people he was like he was like king yeah. of the homeless people in tempe beach party protected them yeah. and that's where he lived yeah. um, but but they got busted and the judge said wild man was a menace to society and banned him permanently from america oh from the whole of usa so i had to send mission impossible style teams of people around the world through canada and mexico to smuggle him back in oh to get him back into the country multiple times i was gonna say like so based off what you're telling me rest in peace wild man always. yeah yeah but he sounds like a bit of a liability man both both so like i said i had i had anxiety and uh, social anxiety but on the drugs it gave me more confidence but with wild man i felt powerful yeah so if me and like wild man and g-dog and seth walked into like a strip club and the bouncers are looking at these guys like these are going to be a handful and we're getting comped in and shit like that it was a powerful feeling for me as a nerdy, skinny business graduate to yeah. be in that clique. Yeah. So my ego then is expanding to the size of the Grand Canyon, <laughs> which sowed the seeds of my own downfall. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. yeah. Eventually, yeah. yeah. But do you feel like, had you of, um, you know, you could have still kept, you know, you could have kept him sweet, still carried on doing what you was doing. And maybe if you didn't bring him back, do you think things would have went all right? Or all right, think- so there's always... Like you described in your story out, and we have to take responsibility for the people we choose to work with. Word, yeah. And it's always internal. Yeah. The trouble that brings everything down. Yeah. Personality clashes and things like that, jealousies. Yeah. So my top ecstasy salesperson was a guy called Skinner. And people warned me not to hire him. He was he was homeless, he was smoking crack, living out of dumpsters. And I, my thing was, you know, I give everybody a chance. I'll give him I sat down with him and said, look, here's a hundred pills on credit. Yeah. You can pay me or you can just rip me off, but you'll have to leave the state yeah, if you yeah. can rip me off. 
and he he came back. He sold them very fast. He's like, give me more, give me five hundred, yeah. then give me a thousand. Yeah. It got to the point where he met a bird in our scene. He had a kid with her, and they had their own house and everything. He was balling. Yeah. Wildman comes over, and now I'm spending more time with Wildman than him. Oh yeah. So he schemed. He did a fake uh, drug rip with another one of my guys, which we saw through. And then he did something even more diabolical. He did the problem reaction solution on Wild Woman. So Wild Man was in prison at this time. He was on another deportation for being, you know, he got caught again. Again, coming back, yeah. Yeah, Wild Woman was on her own in an apartment mm. and a firebomb came through the window, almost set fire to her. Yeah, what, like a Molotov? Uh, I don't know what it was made out of, but a firebomb came through the window. Okay. And then these gangsters showed up that were that were part of Skinner, and Skinner was with us. So they said, look, we're with Skinner. Um, he sent us here so that you can come with us to safety and bring all your shit so no one robs your shit. Yeah. They underestimated Wild Woman. Yeah, yeah, She's like, I'm from fucking Liverpool. <laughs> you know who you're fucking with. Do I look like chopped fucking livers? I don't know you fuckers from Adam. And they fucked off. Yeah, yeah. They fucked off. Yeah. yeah. But then Wild Man, I, he's like, get me out of this prison. I'm going to fucking kill Skinner. Mm. So I got a lawyer to, um, to get him out. He gets back to the UK, jumps on a flight right back to Mexico or Canada. We bring him back in. Yeah. We're like, Peter, you're not killing Skinner. Mm. We are ecstasy, we are rave, we're not going to the murder level, we go to the murder level, That's we've not it, just got yeah. drug cops on us, then we got homicide on us, chill the fuck out, mm. but he, he was just doing meth, smoking meth, smoking crack, constantly staying up, I'm going to kill Skinner, I'm going to kill Skinner, I'm going to kill Skinner, no one could stop him, so Skinner got so scared he went to the cops. And that's how everything started. Wow. Yeah. He, he was the only one. There was 10 that went to the cops, but the other nine hardly knew anything. Yeah. Some of those were Sammy the Bulls people who were trying to get their charges reduced by saying they were double dipping with me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Skinner then, he went to the cops and he left town, but we didn't know that. Okay. So wild man searching for him. And I've got this other guy and he's dead as well. Rest in peace, Joey Crack. So Joey Crack was like a tall, skinny New York Italian guy. He looked like an Afghan hound. He's, he's the way he was, his face was structured. Yeah. And um, whenever he wanted to test drugs, he would go with us, yeah. pull out a syringe, put it in his syringe, and just fucking got it out of his neck. Word. Yeah, he's like, yeah, that's a, that's good drug. Yeah, <laughs> just tell us. <laughs> so and he was what? he was funny as fuck as yeah. well. Um, what type of drugs is he injecting, man? It's like meth and coke and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's. Um, he was, he's showing up at Skinner's house, right? This is just after Skinner's left. Yeah. He didn't know Wildman had found Skinner's house and was waiting for Skinner to come home to kill him. Yeah. So Joey Crack walks in and Wildman grabs Joey Crack like he's about to fucking kill him. And yeah. Joey Crack was telling, because the, the, the Italians later on moved Joey Crack into my cell when I was in jail and they're hearing all these stories. Yeah. And Joey Crack's like, he'd never seen so many weapons in his life. There was like hammers, yeah. screwdrivers, knives, pincers, yeah, fucking yeah. golf club, <laughs> fucking everything in there. He had He's everything. A, on there. a mission, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The wild man's eyes were like popping out of his head. Sweat was just fucking dripping, yeah. dripping off his chin and his ears and everything. But thank God he didn't get his hands on Skinner because we weren't about that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So Skinner ends up snitching and cooperating yeah. with the police. Yeah. Um, and is this when they come and get you? Well, it is, right? So I've already finished the importation now, but they're hot for us now. They've sent undercover cops in. Oh, you know, we're from out of state, older guys. We want a thousand pills. How fucking obvious is that? Yeah. So when I read this in the grand jury indictment, all the paperwork, they were like, all right, so we can't infiltrate them. We've, um, he, he fucking, he's in this car. He just speeds around everywhere. We can't fucking get him in his car. Yeah. He moves around. He's got so many aliases. We can't even put them all in, in the indictment. So we need a wiretap. So the judge authorized the wiretap. Oh, word. So what did Mr. the Skinner guy? Skinner gave him some names and some numbers. And what did and once he you got, Once you got one number, yeah. five people call that. Then you got five numbers. 10 yeah. people call those then you got 50 yeah. it's like a spider's web yeah word yeah. yeah 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 so where did they tap your car your house they your ended up actually they did put um a satellite tracking device on my vehicle they put a net bus trojan horse in my computer so they saw where all my money was so i was flying people from england putting money in their names word yeah yeah and then they had what was it Ten thousand phone calls Shit. 200 co-defendants 
Wow. Yeah. Wow, and they had you at the top of the indictment. The Atwood Enterprise. Shit. Yeah. So how did you um so how like, how did they go about busting you eventually? And did you know so, it was coming? So I, I kind of knew it was coming. That's why I quit a year before, but I thought I got away with it. I yeah. thought they had to catch you with the drugs. Yeah. Mm -mm. But they had you in a conspiracy. Conspiracy. So all it takes is someone to say they did a deal with me in the past seven years. There's a statute of limitations at seven years. Yeah. They got you. So if you had gone clean for seven years, they couldn't bring it up? Correct. For a drug offence. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's different from England because I, I think in England they can just... They don't have statute of limitations here, do they? No, I don't think so. They can so. get you for, for anything. Yeah, for anything, any yeah. time. I think if you yeah. mention something... Uh, yeah. And the case is like they can reopen the case. Wow, and, yeah. that's messed up. Yeah, but um, so yeah, so that's happened, and then what happened next? May sixteenth, two thousand and two. Two thousand and two. I'm on my computer. Yeah, it's like six. Was seven. it before you get into that? Because this is all America, and was it was there FBI involved? Or was it multi-agency investigation? Yeah, multi-agency investigation. So what happened was the New Mexican mafia guys I was clicked up with. They got taken down first. Mm. Then Sammy the Bull's crew got taken down. And then my crew got taken down. So it was all the same resources. And you guys are all operating in Arizona. Yeah, so it's the feds, all the different federal agencies. So you've got mm. like um, the DEA is the main one with drugs. Yeah. You've got like border control because of the importation, you know, customs and that shit. And then you've got the local police. So Arizona state police. But... Because um, a lot of it, our crimes have been out of Tempe. That's where my nemesis was. There was a detective out of Tempe. Yeah. When I read the police paperwork later on, literally he was sat next to me in like restaurants and shit, fucking trying to record my conversations nah, and everything. Yeah. He was my nemesis. Yeah. Yeah, because when this, oh, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. So you got all these different agencies, but it became a Arizona state case, okay. not a federal case. Okay. Yeah. The feds have got a lot more money. So it's a higher class of criminal and there's better conditions. Yeah. The state has got, it's all, it's rough. Yeah. It's rough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so May 16, 2002, my missus is asleep. Yeah. I'm on the computer like seven in the morning. Bam, 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 bam. Tempe Police Department, we've got a warrant, open the door. Now, I don't know if it's cops or if it's people posing as cops who found yeah. out where I live coming to rob me. And these times you're not even selling anything anymore. Not selling. Yeah, yeah. But I'm still using because I've not addressed my demons. Okay, yeah. Jump up, look through the people, it's blacked out. So I'm like, fucking hell, what's going on? Go to the window. Whole building is surrounded. So there's all these cars, SWAT team, everything. And there's more and more of them coming up the outdoor stairs. So I go through to the bedroom to my missus. We're like, what the fuck should we do? Mm. All right, we better let them in. And then we get halfway through the living room and then just it's like ingrained in my conscious it, it, it flew off with such force it just slammed against the wall and the fucking doors like this yeah yeah like fucking bouncing around and then you see them come in with the visors on you can see yeah. their eyes but they're all they've all got they're the masked up in it yeah, yeah yeah but you can see their eyes yeah and there's like an intensity in their eyes and you know if you fuck up now your life's they're gonna, over they're gonna second. take you yeah they don't play games over there yeah America. yeah 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 yeah. So we just dropped because they're screaming at us. Get yeah. on the fucking ground, hands above your head, all that shit. We dropped. And then the nemesis detective just hoists me up by the handcuffs and gets his face in front of my face. He's like, English, Sean, we fucking got you. <laughs> we finally got you. And I'm yelling at my missus then, I'm exercising my right to read silent. I'm exercising my... Over and over again, I'm just yelling that. Yeah. And they, they like, shut the fuck up. And I won't shut up. So they grab me and then just fucking take me down the stairs and put me in the cop car. Put you in a cop car, yeah, yeah. Obviously, they've nicked your missus as well. They put her separately, yeah, yeah, because I don't know the extent of the trouble yet, yeah. So, I'm hoping they're gonna not find anything and let me go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, we get down to Tempe Police Station, and this is the first time you've been arrested in America, or had you been arrested for minor things before? I got arrested for a minor thing, um, but while man had done something, and we got off with that, yeah, he, he took the fall on that one, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But out. you've already been in, a, in an American jail? Not properly, no, because I got bailed out of that situation. Okay. The, the money came fast and got me out. Because what I want to know is like, yeah. because over here we got the police station, then you go to prison. Yeah. And over there, like you've got like jail, which is like, you've got like loads of different people in the same cell. Is it like that in, in reality? It's worse. Yeah. It's worse. So in America, you got jail and prison are different. Yeah. So like you said, you're on remand in a prison. Yeah, yeah. 
remand is jail. Okay, yeah. And prison is where you're sentenced. Okay, yeah. So prison is very transitory. All kinds of people just come in and out all the time. Yeah. No one's settled. Yeah. And so what happened was, um, the first thing they did was the Tempe Police Department had set up some outdoor, like, like mobile home processing thing just for our co-defendants. That's where they took us first. Okay. So they're processing us, sir, and then they take us to Tempe Jail. And that's when I know we're in shit because then as I see my co-defendants coming in, I realize this is not just me. It's bigger than just me. Yeah. So I've got a right-hand man called Cody Bates. He's dead as well. Rest in he, peace. He, he hung himself. And um, he said he was... He, he was the one... We, we rented the house just to put the cash in. Yeah. And he was the only one who knew where it was and the drugs. And yeah. so so if someone needed to re-up, he would take go to the house, get the drugs, go to them, put the money back in the house, come to me and tell me what was happening with everything. Yeah. So I didn't have to touch anything at that yeah. point. So if they've got him, I'm pretty fucked. Yeah, I was about to say, when you seen him there, was you thinking all the money? Oh yeah, that was that was gone. He, I was still thinking though that the, the accounts that had flown over people. Yeah. I was still thinking I had that. Uh, but the, I didn't know about the, the virus, the Netbus Trojan horse they put. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Software engineers from the Department of Justice had put that in there. Um, that was in the the, le the police paperwork. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I said to him, I said, "How did you get arrested?" He said, "I was on the car. I was doing the rounds on my car, you know, doing whatever he was doing, and um, he saw a helicopter." And he was like, I'm on one side of town, I go to the other side of town, I think, that's fucking, that, that helicopter's still there. Sound like Goodfellas right That's now. what he said, <laughs> that's what he said to me, <laughs> just like in Goodfellas. Yeah. And um, I'm just, I'm, I'm too scared to go home or anything, I'm driving around, I'm on the fucking motor freeway. And then all these police motorbikes just surround me and take me off the, the freeway. Yeah. And that's how he got arrested. Sure, and then the, the, the next one was a rave DJ. And it was his first day as a Republican Party fundraiser, Word. he got a job and he was trying to get out the lifestyle yeah. and they showed up at his job and snatched oh, him. Uh, wild woman, wild man. Oh my God, that was nuts because they were always fighting, right? That's why they were called the wild ones. Yeah, yeah. Like she'd fucking stab him and <laughs> eat at her and then they'd be fucking love you and make up sex. Very toxic, you. Yeah. Cave, like cave people level <laughs> fucking... <laughs> Um, love love hate relationship yeah and it, it, scared, like it scared me at times sound like they were meant for each other man. so they're watching them they're watching them and um i think they went in before the actual raid because they were kicking off and they were scared for their lives and they had to pretend it was about something else or something but on the day of the raid i think they just the swat team just came and and uh and took them in so that foot there was like 200, I had about 200 people working for me. Mm. Only, only over 100 got arrested. And that, it took a year to do that. Yeah. The first group was about 12 or 13. And they said they were the heads of the criminal enterprise. And some of them hardly anything to do with us, really. It was, it was a bit silly. Mm. Um, so we're in the Tempe jail. Co-defendants are coming in. And the conditions there are all right. This isn't proper jail yet. Yeah. Central Phoenix, the jail is the Maricopa County Jail run by Sheriff Joe. Yeah. Who's a famous sheriff. He's considered America's toughest sheriff. He's got two TV shows, Smile You're Under Arrest and Inmate Idol. Inmate Idol. Do you know what? I think I've read this. Um, I think this is the research I've done on you. Yeah. Is this the guy that was like making people wear... Pink underwear. Pink underwear. Black and white striped yeah, chain yeah, gangs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so th that's who you ended up being underneath like when you was he's a cold individual his mom died giving birth to him so he's got no maternal empathy bond mm. that was my conclusion when i psychoanalyzed it years later so he's he's the architect of a house of horrors yeah. 50 million had been paid out in lawsuits a lot of that to people the guards had murdered yeah and there was 50 million pending at the time i came in so national geographic and he, and he was still working they loved him the people loved him fuck you know because they hate prisoners they think prisoners lock them up for away the key out there at that time. It's yeah. changed. Perception's changed now. But they were like, um, his his thing was, um, I'm America's toughest sheriff and tough on crime and tent city, you know. One of his favourite quotes, it costs us more to feed our police dogs than our prisoners and our police dogs are working for a living. Wow. 50 cents or less per day to feed the prisoners food. Businesses are thrown away because it's expired and gone mouldy. Yeah. 
the the lawyers uh, suing him got stuff from the kitchen in boxes that said not fit for human consumption and cans from the 1970s. Whoa. There was dead rats in the food. We gave a rat back to the guards one time. They said they would investigate it and they came back later in the day so jail won't get any trouble. Said it was just a potato. Wow. We only got, we barely ate. Breakfast was mouldy bread and green bologna mm. and the evening meal which was called by the time it got to us was a mystery meat slop called Red Death. And that's the one that occasionally had a dead rat Mi in it. Mystery meat. Mystery meat. <laughs> so they wouldn't even tell you what the meat was. No, what they thought. There was rumours that it was emu and all this shit. Whoa. And I lost, uh, in the remand period, I lost about two stone. Yeah. Yeah. Shit, man. Yeah. That sounds tough. But you said um, before then the conditions were all right. What was that like? So the Tempe jail, we were only there for a day. Yeah. It was just a holding jail with normal cells, air conditions that worked, and they fed us. And it was reasonable. Yeah. Then we get in the van to the fucking horseshoe. So the horseshoe is the processing centre for the main jail in Phoenix, the Madison Street Jail. Mm. So you've got all the new arrestees lined up outside. So you've got gangbangers, you've got homeless, you've got people who've been in fights, yeah. you've got people who've been in tasered, you've got people coming down off meth and, and all kinds of drugs and shit. So it's mayhem. It's the quite rough and tumble of people waiting to go in. So in our van, it's half men half women okay the women get off first all the men's heads just fucking turn around immediately because we had some fit birds with us and stuff so then they're all like get your tits out and shit yeah and i'm watching wild man <laughs> on the van and his fucking eyebrow goes up <laughs> i'm like oh <laughs> shit man what's gonna not happen that, next? Not eyebrow. Yeah, yeah yeah so wild woman gets off and they're giving wild woman shit and she's tough as fuck but she's like she's just keeping quiet and shit so it's a stressful situation for her as well so this and at this point, are you are you like in the orange jumpsuit? No, we're, we're not civvies. No, because we've not been processed yet. Okay, yeah, properly. Yeah, yeah. So but, you didn't have your legs chained or nothing like that. Um, yeah, we are chained. We are chained in our civvies. So we got that, and we got fucking ankles. And I can't remember whether there was a belly one, but definitely that, and definitely ankles. ankles. Yeah. So this redneck guard is yelling at the men now to get off the off the, out the van. He wants everyone down the stairs quickly. Yeah. Wild man is at the top of the stairs and he's yelling at him to get off the stairs and wild man won't move. And he's got this like Vikings beard at this point. Yeah. And he just fucking looks at all of the guys yelling at the women. He goes, you lot. I'm losing my voice today. I wish I could, <laughs> I could do this deeper. He's like, um, you lot disrespecting our fucking women. Yeah. In a minute, we're all going to be inside there together. I'll have fucking any of you. I'll have fucking any of you. Unless you shut up right now. Yeah. And, he went, and he just goes, <laughs> he's chained up. He's like, <laughs> and they're like, this guy's a fucking, look like a Viking berserker maniac. Yeah. So they all, they all shut up. They all shut up. And that's, that's why I hardly got in any situations. He was out of your protection. Oh, he's a good man to get arrested with. Yeah. Yeah, there was a point because I was actually before you got into that, I was actually on FaceTime when I was in prison. I was yeah. in FaceTime with prisoners from Arizona. Yeah. Oh no, it was Alabama. Alabama. Oh, Alabama. Shit. Yeah. Deep and South. Yeah. So we, when I was in jail, I kind of linked up with them. We did like a FaceTime. He wow. was showing me around the prison. Yeah. And there's like a hundred people in one room. Yeah. And there's like bunk beds, bunk. There's no nothing separating them enough. And there's like one TV. Everyone goes to watch it together. Mm -hmm. And food. was that how it was like? All right. So the thirteen, the group of thirteen that went through the horseshoe, that took about two days. And at the end of the horseshoe, we've now got our pink underwear, black and white stripes. And the pink underwear is because of this governor. Yeah, humiliate to humiliate us, and we get classified. Yeah. So most of them are classified to minimum security. So this is like the A cat, B cat, C cat thing that yeah, we got over so here. It's so different, man, from, from like our Supermax and our Max. It's locked down. You don't get shit. You don't get out your cell. You don't get to cook food. You don't get anything. It's like, it's like what did you call it? Um, block. The block. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, man, yeah, we're all, we're getting classified. Durango was the minimum security, which is the warehouse, like what you said, the dorm. Okay, yeah. But we, me and Wildman in the beginning went to medium security. Yeah. But because of the prosecutor, I ended up going up up and up and up over the 26 months security levels. Mm. So I go in there with Wildman. The first group of co-defendants can't be housed together. So he sent to one tower, I'm sent to another tower. So right away then the ABs come up to you. Mm. 
What? What's the A B? <coughs> Aryan Brotherhood. Oh, Aryan Brotherhood. Okay, yeah, it's yeah. all racially divided. Yeah, over there. Black gang is the Mau Mau. Yeah. White gang is the Aryan Brotherhood. Yeah. Mexican American gang is the Chicanos. Okay. And the Mexican gang are the Mexican Nationals are the Pisces. So if you're a Mexican American born in America, those gangs are at war with the Mexicans. With the actual Mexicans. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. In the Arizona prison system back then, they were at war. I don't know if it's still the case now, but there was a major violence over that. Yeah. If they teamed up, they'd be the biggest gang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm walking in, and these guys have got like Hitler, one had Hitler, Zeke Heiling over a gas chamber of Jewish people dying inside the gas chamber. No way. Swastikas on the fucking necks, faces, and everything. SS, lightning bolts, Norse runes. You know, it's Celtic uh, and and all this, um, all this AB, yeah. the brand, all the so as, as a white guy, they automatically that like, come to you. Do you want to join? Or? If you're a white guy, yeah. no, you can't join. To join, you got to murder someone. Word. Yeah, to be patched in, you can't join. You, that's the elite. Yeah. Yeah, but you come under control of the Aryan Brotherhood yeah. if you are a white person. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's true for a lot of America. But well, every state's got different rules. So, but it's, yeah, it's very racially divided in Arizona. So they take me into a cell. Yeah. What are your charges? So I've read this shit and I have no fucking clue what it means. Conspiracy, criminal enterprise, crime syndicate. So I say, I don't know, if, I don't know what, my fucking, what my fucking charges mean. They were not happy with that. Yeah. Right away, they've got me up against the wall now, about to fucking batter me. Yeah. What do you mean? You don't know what your fucking charges mean. Are you a fucking chomo? Are you a fucking chomo? I didn't thinking, even know. Thinking like you're some undercover. Didn't know what chomo was. Chomo's yeah. child molester. Oh shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So in the end, they like show us your charges. Yeah. So I have to show them the charges. So they're reading my charges now and they say conspiracy bond $750,000 cash only. And that, turned the whole situation into my favor yeah they were like god damn who'd you guys murder you guys the mafia what yeah it's like no raves cuddle puddles no murders <laughs> yeah. we were fucking mellow and all this shit but they they were loving that that we had that and then i told them about wild man as well yeah because i was i was scared i was like look my main guy's over in this tower They're like yeah we're gonna check so you wasn't out. with him straight away no, you separated because um we were in the first group of co-defendants it was do not house together they didn't want us influencing each other because they wanted to break down, break us all down. For the snitch. trial, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we ended up with the New Mexican Mafia lawyer, so we formed the United Front. So all the co-defendants looked to my lawyer to see what was going to happen next with the case. That also helped people, prevented them from snitching. Okay. But um, later on when the Italian Mafia took over our building from the Aryan Brotherhood, which lasted briefly... They moved. Where would the Italian <coughs> mafia go? Would they be in the ABs? In the so they would be under the control of the ABs. Okay, yeah. But, and one of them contacted me recently, right? And I hadn't seen this guy for 20 fucking years. And he was one of their enforcers. Yeah. His name's Bruno. I've just recently interviewed him three times on my channel. I'm interviewing him again. Yeah, um, I've got to check that one out. Yeah, right? yeah. You and guys check that out He's as well. proper out of good fellas. Yeah. Proper out of good. Got the accent. Everything. Yeah. Everything. And, um... So the head of the Italians, he was like 48 laws, power play, you know, taking over the building from the Urians. Yeah. So if the, if the leader gets beat up, mm. then he loses his spot. Or if he gets moved, he loses his spot. So there's got to be... So all he's got to do is get beaten up. Yeah, if he gets beaten up, he's fucked. And I've got a brilliant story on that. Yeah, go on. yeah I want to hear that one. You want to hear that one? Yeah, of course. All right then. So the head of the whites... I'll call him Tyler, right? And he's been sweating me because he saw my article in the newspaper. So he knows I've got drug connections and he knows I've got my missus visiting me. Yeah. So he's sweating me to, to bring, bring stuff, stuff in. in yeah. And now I'm telling him, I'm slow playing him. Mm. I'm like, yeah, I'm talking to her about it, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm not going to fucking do it. I'm do never going to put my missus on the line like that because these yeah. fuckers, like I said to you, they see the missus get busted with drugs and all they're pissed off about is the loss of the drugs. Drugs, yeah. They so don't care about selfish, the missus, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm slow playing this guy. I'm wondering how I'm going to get him off my case. Wild man is in the other side of the jail in a different tower. So I'm trying to handle the situation myself. But he's the head and I've got to kind of defer to him. So I'm thinking, I'm hoping something's going to fucking happen. And it did. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Right. So... There was this guy I'm going to call Grave Digger, yeah. and he was a six foot, he was over six and a half foot, I think, um, cage fighter. 
Yeah. He had the devil tattooed on his chest as a puppet master. Yeah. And um, there was a, the, 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 the guards like to watch the fights. Yeah. They'd just sit and watch fights sometimes and not stop them. Yeah. Some of them. So he was renowned. Like these guards who like to watch the fights would come and like fucking let him fight. And they, they, word got back like he was just like pinning people down in like wrestling locks and fucking chiseling the fuck out the heads with his yeah. elbows and pool of blood just expanding across the day room shit like that. He's like a trained fighter. But what I want to before you get into that quickly, yeah, yeah. What makes him have the the brazenness like to approach the leader? Of the ABs, if that, do you know what I mean? Isn't he protected by the ones underneath him? Or? All right. So the, the, the leaders of the AB are in the prison in supermax security. Word. Yeah. They're not in the remand jail. Okay. So the leaders of the AB are in the supermax and it's a pyramid structure whereby shot callers run the yards yeah. and in the jails, whoever's the head of the whites whoever's the toughest or whatever, they get, get to control that. But if a shot caller comes in, he takes control of that whole building. Okay. So the building is set up. There's a tower in the middle and a plexiglass bubble called the fishbowl. Yeah. Two guards, right? They're looking down on four day rooms okay. all around it. Separate day rooms separated by corridors. Yeah. So there's two tiers of cells then, right? There's a sliding door, the bottom of the, the tower. And he's automatic... Doors, yeah. yeah, yeah, and then there's if you go to there's a day room, and at the back, there's two tiers of cells. Yeah, that's what they're facing. Those cells were designed for one man, they got 45 men in there, so there's 15 cells. They got three people in a cell, and sometimes they'd have a fourth on the floor. Shit, yeah. It's all about the cheddar. Yeah, more people you get in, more money you can make. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we're hearing words about this grave digger, right? Now, the head of the blacks in our day room was an extremely tough guy i've called him knockout in some stories i call him um smackdown in other stories because i have to change names for legal yeah. reasons yeah you um, can't really put him yeah, yeah yeah so he's undefeated he's, he's never un lost in the fight never lost never lost he's a pro he's a pro boxer and um he's sweating members of all of the races for commissary and that's, that is canteen for me like for the UK people $20 a week you can spend yeah I couldn't eat the fucking red death I couldn't eat the breakfast yeah so a meal for me is a Snickers bar yeah. or a packet of peanuts and I'm, I'm rationing it like one you know peanuts and then Snickers bar and that's my day that's all I've got Good. so he's coming in my cell and he sweated me as well you know blah 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 kind of give us a Snickers bar I'm like well if I give you a Snickers bar I'm fucking going to go hungry, blah, blah, blah. So I was fending him off a bit, but he did sweat a lot of people and get stuff out of him. Yeah. So he made me feel uncomfortable, but he was a good fight. He was good to watch. <laughs> so um, what happened was um, the head of the whites wasn't really doing anything about him. Oh, so he was just moving to sort of disguise from he the He knew. If, if our head of the whites called let's call him uh, Smackdown yeah. if our head of the whites called Smackdown out Smackdown would twat him Yeah, he would be rolled up if he, if, he, if the head of the white loses his fight he's rolled up Yeah, which means you get your mattress all your shit all your property in your mattress you roll it up and you're gone you got, yeah. a, you got a knock on the sliding door and you are gone yeah because I've seen like 60 days in jail and like when people are moving they get their mattress and roll up the door. Yeah. even the guards say roll up yeah. roll up and it's embarrassing. Everyone's watching you as well. Like everyone's you know. watching you. It's the walk of shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the cage fighter ends up in our day room okay. with us. Yeah. So now Tyler's got main muscle. Yeah. So he completely changes. Okay. He's a badass now, yeah. or so he thinks. Yeah. So he thinks. So we're all at breakfast, and um, he says something. Tyler calls out. Smackdown. He calls him out because he thinks he's got this muscle now. Yeah. 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 And um, Smackdown. I'm trying to. I, I wrote it down right and sent sent to my girlfriend the exact dialogue. That's how I remember. Yeah. She, even though we broke up, she sent me all the letters years later, and I yeah. fucking that's how I got it in the book. Hard time. But I'm gonna try and remember it off uh, what what they said roughly. So he's like, Smackdown's like, um, who who. Who are you disrespecting? You know, 
ain't no white boy gonna fucking talk to me like I'm a fucking bitch. Yeah. And um, <laughs> get, get in that fucking cell because to get to the top tier, there's like a metal grid stirs. Yeah. And the cell under the metal grid stirs is is obscured a bit from the guard tower. Yeah. So if people are gonna fight, the guys under the stirs. Put all the property under the fucking mats under the bunks, yeah. and people just fight, and then the beef squashed usually. Yeah. So um, he he, he uh, SmackDown goes in the cell, doesn't he, and waits. So uh, SmackDown goes in the cell trying to fight the now head of the Carter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tyler. 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 Tyler yeah. <laughs> um, and Tyler goes in, and fucking gets his ass beat fast. And he runs out of it so he runs out of the cell so fast he runs into the metal grid stairs and bangs his head. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he sits back down at the woods table, the whites table. Yeah. And um But they just all disappointed in him. <laughs> they're looking at him like and then fucking SmackDown's like, what the fuck was that? Get your ass back in this fucking cell, fucking yeah. you punk ass bitch. Yeah. The worst thing you can call anyone is a punk ass bitch. Yeah. It's mandatory you have to fight if they call you that. Like you be, have to, being oh. called a bitch is kind of like being called a snitch over here. Like, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not being called a snitch or in a America. nonce or something like it's that. It's just being called a pussy, basically. Yeah, yeah. So that's the worst thing you can say is you, you punk ass bitch. You have to fight. So he's at the door calling him a punk ass bitch and everything. And then um, the woods are looking at at um, Ty what, Tyler. 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 They're looking yeah. at him. And Tyler's like, the head of the. Yeah, and they're like, you gotta go and fight again. He's like, I already fought. Yeah, I already fought. So he's not even trying to get back in. Not even trying to get back in. Yeah. And then Grave Digger, who hasn't said anything, just fucking stands up, and he's like six foot fucking seven or something. <laughs> Folds his arms like that, and he just looks down, and he's like, "You, you fucking get in there right now, and you have to fucking deal with me." <laughs> and he's like, and he just goes right back in, and they get beaten the shit out of again. He's gone. So and then yeah, he, he's that's rolled that's up. That's he's it. And then fucking the, the lunatics, the head of the whites, then. So the other guy that put it on Tyler, he's now the head of the whites. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. That's crazy, man. It, um, um, what's his, what do they call him? Grave Digger's now the head of the whites. Yeah. So then he orchestrates a race riot because he was just, he didn't give a fuck. Yeah. Usually they don't want the violence to escalate to that level because everyone gets locked down, it stops the drugs. Yeah. But he didn't give a fuck. So um, what happened was Smackdown was still bullying people of all races for mm. food. For and, and, that, yeah. and the heads of all of the races except for the blacks had a meeting. So you've got the whites head, you've got the Mexicans, Mexicans head, you've got the Mexican-Americans head. And they said if they sent one torpedo, the torpedo would lose the fight and SmackDown would claim his right to remain. Yeah. So we're all going to send the torpedo each yeah. and have backup outside. Yeah. So one of my co-defendants ended up in the mix. His name was Henry, and he was a cowboy from Nebraska. Yeah. Then there was Diablo, who was the Mexican enforcer. Yeah. And then there was the Chicano enforcer. I can't remember what his name was. So they waited until the blacks were downstairs at their table, but SmackDown was in his cell. Oh, uh, slipping by himself. Yeah. yeah, so three torpedoes go in. They've got three more torpedoes on the upper tier in case for backup yeah and people downstairs like watching but the blacks are just got getting on with the business because they don't know what's about to kick off yeah so i was on i think i was on the phone with my uh girlfriend at the time and they all they slipped in and you just heard the you know the usual noises mm. you get used to the sounds of those noises yeah dum, 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 dum. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah when it breaks up in the cell yeah. yeah and then oh this gets crazy and then um there was a, a a black guy who was massive he was like he was like a bowling ball yeah and he fucking he, he got up the stairs right but then the torpedoes on the upper tier pushed him down oh, yeah. and there was like there was, there was like a battle on the stairs right so many people on the stairs fighting and then this the, the bowling ball guy just fucking just fucking comes down and knocks everybody out of the <laughs> people were picking up mops and brooms and doing ninja moves and everything it just yeah. went crazy everyone started fighting i was just on the phone with my bird and i'm looking at the fucking the fish bubble yeah. and there was two there was a particularly tough guard on duty that day 
usually they press a button and the, like nine of them fucking run down, in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He just puts on a spacesuit, doesn't he? He's got like a fire extinguisher sized canister of spray. Yeah. Of chemical spray. And he's coming down the stairs. I'm, oh, it's like a little winding stairs at the bubble. Yeah. I'm trying to get up the stairs to the upper tier because I'm in an upper tier cell. The battle is raging on the stairs. And um, he just comes in then. The, the door slides. He comes in on his own and just sprays the whole fucking room. Word. And then people start to disperse. Yeah. So I'm able to get up into my cell. And I've got an old timer with me, actually. Because all the snot stripping out of me and my eyes are all yeah. streaming and shit. And the old timer, he said, you wet a towel and you wrap it around your head and you just blink over and over and over again to get the chemical shit out your eyes. Yeah. So that's what I did. Now, in the cell with um, Smackdown Cell, I, I like to learn what had happened. He, he, he was such a proficient fighter so my co-defendant, Henry, had come up behind him and put him in a chokehold. Yeah. He had fucking just sandwiched him against the wall, put his head forward, flipped his head back and broke Henry's nose. Nose and the head back, Broke yeah. his nose instantly. Yeah. The other two were doing body blows, but they managed to get out before the cell was locked. Yeah. So now you've just got Henry oh, and Smackdown in the cell, cell fighting. Ooh. And the guards are just opening up with the chemical spray. Yeah. So the whole cell is just a fucking cloud of chemical spray and they're fighting blind. Yeah, yeah. In the end, they stopped fighting and Henry came out and it's, it's the same as what you told me with the nose. Yeah, he couldn't see nothing. So Henry's got a very polite cowboy accent yeah. and he goes, um, before you put the handcuffs on, do you mind if I fix my nose? Yeah. And he just fucking crunches the fucking yeah. nose back into place. Oh, yeah, oh, mate, yeah. Yeah. And then SmackDown comes out and he looks completely uninjured. <laughs> and then they're, they're taking him out and he's all oh, you motherfuckers doing that three on one shit. I'm going to get all y'all when I get out of lockdown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yo, that's nuts, man. Yeah. That's crazy, bro. Yeah, he was a good fighter. Yeah. He didn't come back to our building, though. No, nah, but he was probably a legend when he left that he place. He was a ledge. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know what I want to know? Um what i think you've kind of briefly gone over the food and everything like this mm. shit, the food was shit um what was the lockdown hours like or can you describe a typical day other than the fighting and that mm. yeah can you describe a typical day in a, an american prison yeah Me maybe medium well the security you was okay in. so in towers jail medium security then so on the day room you've got a little fucking old tv bolted to the wall that barely works people are fiddling with it and shit to try and keep it working yeah You've got octagonal silver tables bolted to the floor. I think there's four of them. Yeah. So each race has their own table. Yeah. And then you got on this TV, the, the leaders, the heads of each gang have got to agree on what hours the whites get to watch it, what hours the Mexicans get to watch it. And because they got the Spanish speaking programs. Okay. Well, there was one program that everyone came out for and that was caliente and yeah. caliente is just like um it's like a mexican like they're on the beaches and all the senoritas are dancing in the bikinis yeah. and shit so everyone so didn't mind that one all these fucking skinheads yeah. who said they're you know racist with hitler on them and shit all coming out watching caliente yeah. and um so they're watching the tv it was the tv was absolutely shit it was like these old westerns like bonanza and stuff like that there was, there was nothing Oh, they're playing games. Um, what was that game they always played? The cards game that they gambled over. Oh, I can't remember what it was called because I never got into it. I got into the chess. Chess. Yeah, so the Russian guy, he was like, he was really good at chess. So me and him buddied up and a lot of my time was spent with him. Playing chess. And yeah, and, and one of my racial mistakes in the beginning was I didn't understand everything and I'm working out with Sniper and Sniper's a Chicano. He's a Mexican-American Mexican, La yeah. Victoria Tempe gang member. Mm. I don't know whether it was Gravedigger or Tyler. Uh, um, um, yeah. But they're like, I'm working out with Sniper. And they're like, hey, Wood. We want a word with you, Wood. Mm. And I'm like, what's up? And um, come in the cell. And I look at Sniper. He's like, yeah, go talk to your people. So I go in the cell. And they're like, look around the day room, Wood. I look around the day room. 
Do you see any white boys working out with the other races? Yeah. I'm like, nope. I'm like, you got a lot to learn, Wood. Finish your workout. <laughs> yeah, so that was last time I was working out with fucking Sniper. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but um, the best time we had it in the jail was when the Italian mafia took over. Yeah. And the head of the Italian mafia in the building, um, it was amazing, man. He corrupted the guards so much. I mean, and like he was he, getting all types of things. In. He was out at night when we were all locked down, smoking with the guards, giving them orders. Yeah. His girlfriend was coming as a lawyer, giving him blowjobs in the legal visit room. Wow, nice. Yeah, yeah but sadly, um, Bruno updated me on what happened to him. His name's Marco in Hard Time. That's the name we used for him. And he's in Supermax now for a double homicide conspiracy. What, in jail? Supermax prison in Arizona. But was the double homicide in jail or was that outside? Outside. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Before we finish off on your prison experience, because I've got a few more questions to ask on... <clears throat> On your prison, yeah. I wanted to ask, um, what did you get, man? What what sentence did you get? All right, so we paid a lawyer hundred grand, yeah, and we got this was the New Mexican Mafia lawyer. We did the United Front, so they, they had a weak case then. They didn't have people rolling over left and right. They had no uh, drugs against me. They only had me talking about personal use on the phone. So we managed to get it down to nine and a half years. And as a first time non-violent drug offender. I only had to serve six. Six years. Because he was a loophole lawyer, and that was the loophole he found me. Because I was um, a UK citizen. So first time, non-violent drug offender that was a UK citizen, I only had to serve six of my nine and a half. And the nemesis detective, when we went to my sentencing hearing, my parents had flown 5,000 miles to, to come to it, and the detective kicked off, and it was almost cancelled. Because oh. when they um, clarified that I only had to do six... Yeah. It was almost cancelled. Yeah, I fucking shit myself because I've been fighting my case for twenty six months in oh. in, in that hellhole, yeah. in that hellhole jail. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 26 yeah. Months. Twenty six months. Yeah. Would it, you? Would you? Um, like, how long was your trial? You don't go to trial in Arizona. No. If I went to trial, I would have got two hundred years. Shit. Yeah, they made it clear, and the guy before me. He refused a 15-year plea bargain. They gave him 200. So you took a plea bargain? Eventually. Everyone takes plea bargains. 98% take plea bargains in Arizona. And that's not snitching. Yeah. A plea bargain is just you get up in front of the judge and say, you did it, send me to prison. And yeah. that's what happens. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That's basically over here as well. Same mm -hmm. thing. Um, So you took your plea bargain. Over there, because over here we got sort of standard sentence over here. Yeah. You do half of it. Yeah, yeah. And then what's called the EDS sentence is like if the crime was more violent, you do two thirds out of it, like in America. So in America, and if you do like a murder, you do all of it. All day. Yeah. So in America, is the standard like two thirds? No. No? Because every single state is like a different country and has its own laws and it has its own sentencing and it has its own prison and legal culture. So if you compare one state with what's, say like you compare my story with a, someone who's been in prison in florida for example yeah now one of my co-defendants well one of my friends is a dj happens to have been in prison in florida mm. and in arizona yeah and he said like you know yeah all the racial stuff in arizona doesn't apply to florida it was completely different okay so yeah things are yeah. just things are just different in different completely, places every state is completely different and then the feds is completely different as well yeah so the federal the Bureau of Prisons for the Feds is all across the all the states, but that's the U.S. federal government. Yeah, it's not the states. Yeah. So that's a whole different system. So you could have someone in the Feds in Arizona, but you can't compare that to the in the state in Arizona. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get. It, yeah. I get. It. The Feds is cleaner. Yeah. They got a lot more money. Okay. Yeah, and it's a, a different class of criminal, whereas the state is all the, the local criminals. Yeah. 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 I, I get that. What I wanted to know was, do people actually get raped over there? Yeah, you have to go to a rape class to get taught how not to get raped. Is it? Yeah. It's what, like self-defense or something? No, it's under the Prison Rape Elimination Act. It is mandatory now that all the prisoners have to go to the rape class. Yeah. So basically, you get a slip under your door saying the time and the date of the rape class. Okay. And when that happened, I had no idea about it. The prisoners are all joking. What are they going to teach us to fucking rape each other? They're going to give us rape kits and all that kind of shit. And then fucking we get to um, the rape class and there's like a video yeah. 
So there's predators in the day room. Young people are coming in, they're hungry, and then the predators are like, do you want some food? Right? Mm, yeah. Grooming them, like. And then hours later, like, right, you got to pay for the food now. Yeah, you are pay, you going to get stabbed? You pay with your ass. How are you going to pay? How am I going to pay? Well, go in that cell and do what he says. Shit. And once they do that, there's no coming back. So the terminology in America is um, getting turned out or becoming a prison punk. Yeah. And then they rented out as prison prostitutes. Fuck and the conclusion of the rape class was to stop rape, you got to report it. And everyone just laughed their fucking asses off. Because no one's going to snitch. KOS for snitches. Yeah. Because like over here, if you're raping people, you're going to become a victim. It's a different culture, yeah, isn't, a different it? Culture, totally. isn't it? Totally. So you got people getting lifed off who are on meth. And they got fucking... I'll, I'll, I'll try and remember what T-Bone told me back in the day in the walls. This was in, in uh, the 70s and the 80s in, in Florence Prison, Arizona. And he said there was a smell on the run from so many dudes getting raped. And T-Bone was a six and a half foot black guy, a former Marine, entire body covered in scars, yeah. horseshoe size scars from all of his fights. Yeah. He, he was amazing. And he was, he was interfering and, and stopping people from getting raped and he was risking himself for people he didn't even know. He said back when he first came into prison, there was a smell on the run from so many dudes being raped. Fucking and he said, little white boys were getting kissed like they were women. Wow. That's what he said. And he said, um, even worse, they were sticking things inside them, like broomstick handles oh, and bottle, shampoo one. bottles and shanks. Yeah. And, and all. It's one of my blogs, actually. So the, the, one of the things about my story is, because I started blogging, I mean, like you started documenting yeah. it in video form. I wanted to get, I'm going to get onto that in a second. I started blogging it in, in written form. Yeah. So all my story, most of it is actually time stamped online. People can go back and read it, what happened, what I wrote, what happened, because yeah. it was all getting put online as it happened. And I, I encourage everyone. John's to, Jail Journal. Yeah, <laughs> I encourage everyone to go yeah. and look at that. So that's what I was going to get onto next. When I came to the end of my sentence, mm. I started blogging it, but, but on my smartphone. Yeah. And obviously you did the same but years earlier there wasn't phones or nothing like that you was writing everything down in a journal that's what I, was, I was like this guy is my kindred spirit <laughs> when you were telling me all that stuff last night and I was fucking hell he's done like it's just like yeah wow yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's yeah. crazy man isn't it but um uh, how did you come about doing that can you talk us a bit through that and then how that kind of got you to where you are now yeah yeah blogging you yeah. do what I do you speak to prisoners all right so we've got about 10 minutes all right so um, like I said, I was fighting my case and the prosecutor was trying to break me down psychologically. Yeah. So a year in, my lawyer, he's like, we're going to have a bail hearing, 750000 maybe you can fight your case outside. I was all excited, girlfriend's excited. Prosecutor sabotages the hearing, judge doubles my bail to 1.5 million. So then I was moved from medium security to maximum security. Sure, yeah. yeah, so in maximum security, it's just pure lockdown. And, um, were you out for an hour a day or something? So in, in the day room, um, they would let us... They would let us go into the day room for, for a few hours, um, but like no sunlight. Okay. Yeah. So I went between Max and Supermax, I went a year and a half without any sunlight. Shit. Yeah, yeah. So in the beginning, um, it was cockroach infested in Max, and then later on, it was cockroach infested. And I just started writing home about these things. Yeah. And I said to so God, how'd you guys get away with dead rats in the food, roaches all over us at night? Guards murdering mentally ill prisoners. And the guard said, the world has no idea what's going on in here and the public doesn't give a shit about prisoners. 100%. So yeah. something snapped in my head. I thought, right, I'll fucking show you who cares about prisoners. Yeah. With a little pencil sharpened on the door, I started to write it all down. Now, in maximum security visitation, I couldn't pass this and I couldn't put it in the mail because they can open your mail. And read it, yeah. But I hid it in things I could release to my aunt through the property visitation officer. Yeah. So I get I get this uh, slip, it's called a tank order, get permission to release property, old books, letters, legal paperwork. I hid it in that. Yeah. So I'm doing the penguin shuffle up to visitation, yeah. holding all my property. The visitation officer takes my property, puts it on his table, and then I go into a cubicle, plexiglass window, I'm handcuffed to a fucking desk and I've got the other hand on the phone. Yeah. And my aunt's, beha my aunt's behind the plexiglass screen. Yeah. Like, Claddy, Starling, Hannibal, like, you know, it's, it's, that kind of thing. It's kind of like a, um, what we would call close visit in England, where you've okay. got a screen there, yeah. you can only talk through the phone. So that's standard in Max. Okay, yeah. And then, at the end of the visit, my aunt took the stuff with her, typed it up, emailed it to my family in Witness, 
and they put it online as John's Jail Journal, J O N, so that it wouldn't be associated with me. Yourself, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's how it began. Wow. Yeah. So you come out now. Um, before we just get into the to the like how this kind of propelled you to to do what you're doing now. Um, what was your final days in prison like? Oh man, you, we're only on year two right now. Yeah. There's four no, years. There's I, four <laughs> years. We've got supermax. Yeah. I did three years in supermax because. The prosecutor, a final farewell to me was she accidentally put my sentence down as 34 years Shit. instead of nine. Shit, so yeah. I was fast tracked to Supermax, which is a fucking hot. The stories I've got about shit slingers and things like that yeah. from Supermax. Fucking we'll probably, hell. hopefully, one day we can, like, you can come in and then yeah. get into way more detail. So then know? I go to the Department of Corrections, yeah. multiple prisons, as I'm wor I work medium, I start out in, then minimum. Then I'm in deportation, feds. Oh, then yeah. I'm on Connor. Back from LA, back to is it Gatwick or Heathrow? There's actually a video of me on the channel. Um, all stubbled out at the airport, and I'm looking fucking crazy. Oh, so they they dip, deported you back to England? Eventually. Yeah, Connor, I'm banned for life from America. For life, yeah. 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 Shit, man. Mm -hmm. So you can't even not even for work or nothing like that. Can't go there now. I'd I'd have to finish my sentence, and they'd give me a new sentence. Oh shit, man. Yeah. Man, that's so, crazy. So, so I got out then in December 2007 and my dad had started the channel that year. Yeah. But we only posted a video every now and then, how to survive, Sheriff Joe Pies Jail, things like that. So it was the first prison blog and the first prison YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Word. Yeah, but the, 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 but the podcasting didn't really start till about four or five years ago, yeah, properly. Because that was kind of a new thing, podcasting. And stuff. After I went on to True Geordie, I was inspired by Brian and Lawrence. Thank you, guys. And I wanted to get other people's stories out. It had all been my story. Yeah. And then all these good people helped me rise up. So I felt it was my duty, to get other karmically, prison. to help guys who got out of prison get their stories out. Because in prison, a community formed around the blog, right? The different characters I was writing about. And there was jealousies and, and camaraderie and all the usual, you know, uh, play of human nature there. But what I found, what I learned was, all of them have got good and bad, including me, including yeah. you and us. Yeah. If you focus on the good in people, it helps it to come out. 100%. So no matter how people dissed other people about the negative stuff, I'd, I'd be like, forget about that. Mm. Let's just focus on the good, on the good yeah. and raise each other up Word, yeah. and collaborate. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I truly imp uh, appreciate what you're doing. Mm. You know, I know you're, insp you're an inspiration for loads. Um, hopefully, we can get you back on. Totally, to, man. I'd to, love it. Yeah, to, to just to fit because of time. We haven't been able to get yeah, into your yeah. full prison story, but we'll get you back on and then we'll, we'll get fully into it because I know you've got loads to say. I've got loads to ask. Loads. Um, yeah. Um, quickly, though, because what I always ask is, do you have any advice um, to younger people that may be getting themselves into trouble? It's hard, isn't it? Because you're invincible. Yeah. You're on drugs. You're the man. It's the fast cash. You're pulling the birds. You think this is it. It's going to last forever, but it doesn't. Yeah. When your mum has to fly 5,000 miles to come and visit you and she's been waiting outside with sniffer dogs on her ass, and she's fucking an old lady and she's coming in and you see her bent over in the visitation room and you fucking done that to her and it breaks your fucking heart. Yeah. That's what you're going to have to fucking deal with because that's just one of the many consequences and it yeah. makes me sick to my stomach still what I put my mum through. I can see that, man. Yeah, you yeah. Know, you're yeah. a genuine guy, bro. Thank you. Um, can't wait to see you again. Everyone, <laughs> everyone, yo, Check out Sean Atwood's story. Go and get his book. Um, he's got an amazing story. We've <laughs> just, we've just like, go and show the book. Hard time, the trilogy. That's the middle section. Party yeah. time, hard time, prison time. Go and check that out. Um, we've just touched the surface on his story. We're just short for time. So we'll get another episode out and we'll get all the way into his prison story. Thank you, bro, for coming down. Yeah, so I was on the prison shake then. Hand shake is that, then that, yeah. and then the bumping. 